Carlos Nelson with What's Up Kansas City and today we're going to be talking technology on our Tech in Motion show and we have a special guest tonight. Who do we have here? I'm Ron Green, the Executive Director of the Digital Storytelling Center of Kansas City. Hey Ron, tell our audience a little bit about what you do and a little bit about yourself. Okay. Uh, as a nonprofit leader, uh, I'm trying to really make a difference in the talent pipeline for digital media in Kansas City. So our nonprofit, we focus primarily on kids K through 12, and we try to teach them digital media skills. Uh, but we're also trying to help the digital media industry in Kansas City become more organized to help themselves get that talent pipeline. Uh, working well for the city and I'm also in relation to all that I'm working on the project to renovate the uh, can't the Laffer Grant building where Walt Disney started his uh, animation efforts here in Kansas City so it all relates to where, where's the where's the Laffer Grant building located excuse me yeah, and, yeah the Laffer talk a little bit about that whole situation sure the Laffer Grant building is located at 31st and Forest which is one block east of 31st and Truce so it's right around the corner from Operation Breakthrough, Reconciliation Services, and all of that. Um, that building was built uh, around 1922. Walt Disney started his company, Laffogram uh, Films, in 1922. Uh, what is interesting about that effort, um, first of all, he had no business even dreaming of doing something like that because there was no animation west of New York at that time. Now think about it, 1922, movies were still young and uh, they were all silent movies at that time. And he gets in his head, he's going to start an animation company in Kansas City. Uh, what's interesting about that is he puts an ad in the Kansas City Star and he says, I'm looking for experienced uh, animators for this new business. Well, there wasn't an experienced animator animator anywhere to be found. So he hired uh, streetcar drivers, bakers, anybody who had drawing talent, and they checked out two different books from the Kansas City Public Library that helped, that they used to teach each other how to do the animation process. In fact, the library still has one of those books that he checked out in their special collections. Uh, what is especially interesting about that building is it's called the, the uh, cradle of Hollywood animation. And the reason for that is, you know, Walt businesses, Walt's business did well at first, but it went bankrupt a year right. later. And he had to leave town. There's no way he could stay in town with the debt that he had incurred. And they said, get out of Dodge. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. If, if anyone could have looked down the road to see what was going to happen in the future, you would have had people crawling all over saying, Walt, stay here. You, you, Here's some money. Stay. Do, do you, you, you know the Disney story. Uh, you know his brother was uh, played a significant role. In That's exactly right. If it were not for his brother, Roy, who actually worked as a teller at the bank in the building that is now the Central Library, uh, his brother was the one who brought financial yeah. acumen to that business. You know, Walt was a creative who wanted to explore the possibilities of creativity, spend all the money on the world, and right back into let's be more creative. Well, his brother Roy, until he hooked up with Roy in California, right, right, he he was not putting that. That, that was the connection, people. really. It uh, really was. That's why went. he went. That's right. why he went to the L.A. area. So what, but what happened while he was still in, here in Kansas City, all those people he hired and that had been trained to do animation, um, he, when he went bankrupt, got to California, he was trying to become a movie producer or director and that, that didn't work out. So his brother encouraged him to do what he knew how to do and start an animation company. He got a nice contract and he called all his Kansas City buddies out to California to help with this new business. Well, all the movie studios in that L.A. area were wanting to start cartoon studios, right. but they had nobody who knew anything right about place, it. The right place, the right time. Exactly. Timing is everything. Exactly. So here's Walt bringing in all this knowledgeable expertise into their area, and Walt was a little bit hard to work for, and he didn't pay them what they thought they were worth. But most people, mo most of the, you, you, you hear stories about Steve Jobs and, uh, and all of these people that have been driven, mm -hmm. uh, they're difficult, I'm difficult. Yeah, yeah it's true, and, and, and Walt was a genius, and he stuck to, he knew what he was talking about, and because he stuck to his guns on that, a lot of times when you're creative and you have your own ideas, that doesn't 
Yeah, well, very well. Right. Uh, uh, we're a cookie cutter society, but Willie, uh, the steamboat, and Mickey, and Minnie, mm -hmm. boy, changed the world. He really, Literally. He really did. There's just the impact he's had on entertainment. There's nobody in the entertainment world that's had the kind of lasting impact. That so, so how is that related? Uh, we, we talked about that. How do you see what you're doing related to that? Okay, uh, there's really a good answer to that, and that is, um, uh, I'll tell a little bit about this. I was seeing when I was working at Hallmark some needs for Kansas City to build this digital media talent pipeline. pipeline. Cut you off again. Yeah. Tell our audience about your Hallmark. How long? Give, give them some experience on sure. what you. I worked at Hallmark Cards for 32 years. I'd started out as a teacher, and, and I got the job as an editor, and, and that led to being an editorial director. Uh, but the job I loved most while I was at Hallmark, I was asked to, to start the, uh, the creative university program there. So it was a, a training program for the creative division. We had 1,400 creative professionals, the largest in-house creative staff in the world. I didn't need to teach them their craft. They knew their craft, but what they didn't know was emerging technologies. So my staff and I worked on transforming Hallmark and along with a lot of people in the creative division to move those conventional artists into becoming graphic designers, helping people build up storytelling skills. Almost everything we worked on tended to be more about emerging technology. As it came online. Yes, because that's what they needed to be able to contribute their talents in the best format available to them with the technologies that were uh, coming, uh, coming and that's how you became interested in what you're doing now. Yeah, because what happened was Hallmark was starting to do some made-for-TV animations. They, they they did a couple of uh, NBC programs. One was a stop-motion animation. One was a classic animation. And I wanted to see our company use the talent that they had in their own halls to, to do a lot of that story development, character development. But, but most of that work got outsourced to areas like Poland, Asia, and Portland. And uh, I hated to see that work go elsewhere when we had so many talented people. I mean, they needed a lot of training, but that was my job. I knew you know, what needed to be done to get that done. And in the process of trying to con uh, convince management that this is a direction they needed to take, I got to working with Mid-America Regional Council, Kansas City Area Development Council, Kansas City uh, KCEDC, the Economic Development Council, and others to kind of point out, you've got a major industry in this town that you're not getting behind like you are with, with uh, like uh, bioscience and uh, logistics and some of these other agencies. Uh, but uh, so we got some research done by the Mid America Regional Council that showed there are about 34,000 people who do what I call digital storytelling work. Digital storytelling I would define as any use of technology to enhance your ability or your reach. To like TED Talks. Oh, uh, uh, well, yeah, TED Talks, it's online. It's, you know, so, so you're able to watch that from anywhere in the world. Uh, animation is a good example of digital storytelling because now it's no longer you know, drawing on cells. It's, you know. Yeah, we talked about system. that earlier. How, how do you see uh, our, our young uh, community uh, getting involved in in, in this technology? Well, the first thing I would say about that is, even if they are never going to be a, a, in a career position for digital media, every K through 12 graduate needs to have strong multimedia communication skills. When I graduated, when you graduated from high school, the, the golden ticket was your ability to write effectively. Your, your exact mundo. <laughs> and today, You've got to be able to recreate a website. You need to be able to know what, what it might be like to create a blog. You've got to know how to do video editing, uh, use sound and audio. Uh, I mean, if you're really going to make your, if you're really going to be persuasive and influence other people, you've got to use the full range of And, and that's tools. just being a human being in the 21st century. That's exactly it. Let me give you an example of how some schools are taking that and really making sure that they're preparing their kids. At the University of North Carolina, there's a freshman communication class, and when they take that class, they have to do a turn paper. I don't know if you had to do turn papers, but as an English major, I got tired of doing turn papers. Yeah, I did turn papers. I don't know what they look <laughs> like. <laughs> well, the worldwide audience of my turn papers were two, and that's assuming the professor even read it. Right. 
What they do at North Carolina, you have to do that term paper, but in addition, you have to create a blog, a website, uh, a, a, a video presentation. They have five um, multimedia formats that you have to take that same information and provide it. And what's interesting, because they then just, it's more than just the professor that sees it, because it's out on the web, the way that nets out and really reaches people is amazing. So that, that work means something more than helping someone get it. Well, that's hurt. like what, what the, with my interns that we have from the different colleges and what have you, they do their projects. And one of the major things that I find, and I think I told you I started our company with high school kids, mm -hmm. uh, is that they want to learn it, but they want to see it. They want to see it uh, on the internet, mm -hmm. their projects, what they've done. That's and right. that has been a real key uh, incentive with Cascade Media Group mm -hmm. that not only that they're doing interviews, they're doing editing, their work can be seen. Hey, I did that. Yeah. That, that, that voiceover, that was me. Yeah. There's a magic to the use of multimedia that people just can feel a great pride in. Uh, I'll give you an, an interesting example of what my journey to learn more about multimedia. As an editor and a, and a writer, to me, a page of words was just a thing of beauty. But when I started training those designers, I, you know, they could not tolerate that. They, it needed to be visual. I learned the value of visual imagery and, and moving imagery really fast when I had a design audience. Oh, all right, you know, uh, like you was talking about English major and, and that, a lot of people don't don't understand. I used to think I had some type of disability, but what, what I really found out that I received all my information, audio and video, mm -hmm. uh, uh, visual, mm -hmm. uh, and I learn just as much as a person that reads a good book. Mm -hmm. I can listen to a, a good book. And I think our society is moving into the multimedia uh, type of audience because of the web, because of Facebook, because of everything that they're doing. I mean, if it's not visual, you're going to have a difficult time uh, Keep, keep, yeah, keeping your audience, especially since everybody has a phone, and so that's why they call it smartphone <laughs> and smart devices in yeah. general. Mm -hmm. You ride down the highway, they driving. I bet you out of ten cars, you yeah. see three to four people texting or doing something yeah. while they're driving. Yeah, not smart people using smartphones. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, talk a little bit more about what you're doing uh, with your company, and we talked about the nonprofit situation sure. and what does it cost to put the gas in the tank? Oh, this was a major learning for me because I had all, you know, most of my career was at Hallmark. Uh, you know, you were always given what you needed to do the job. You had the equipment, tools, and training to, to get it done. And I, you know, I also came, uh, you know, I had an MBA, so I kind of knew a lot about business. Well, I thought, you know, moving into the nonprofit sector would not be that difficult. I had been, in fact, at Hallmark, I had been pretty effective at helping them to get grants for workforce development and um, um, innovation and research. Uh, in my last 10 years at Hallmark, I brought in over $12 million worth of those kind of grants. So I thought, well, I'll be able to pull in money for nonprofits, no problem. It has been an unbelievably difficult uh, challenge raising money well, for a nonprofit. What do you feel about, uh, we'll go a little bit politics, don't want to go there, <laughs> but uh, the city fathers or whoever, they, they, they say they want this to be a smart city. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they're doing everything uh, because, as you say, funding, that they could be doing to really make this a hub. Mm -hmm. Well, they're doing some things that are interesting. I like what they're doing with some of the smart devices on, along the streetcar route, and I, you know. T talk, tell me, see, I'm not familiar well, with a know, lot of that. They have a lot of interactive kiosk at those spots where you can learn more about your route or when, when to expect the train to come or what's, I mean, there's a lot of actually promotional opportunity for the city through the, what they do there. And I know uh, from knowing some of the people who are working on that, like Aaron Deacon or Rick Usher, they've got some interesting things going on. The problem for an organization like mine is we're not in the center of civic attention uh, in terms of infrastructure and you know supporting big business and that, that type of thing. We're trying to reach people at the street level 
And uh, our biggest curse in my mind, in terms of not being able to generate the revenues I'd hoped we could generate, is what we do with kids looks like frivolous, uh, rev uh, I, I call it, um, that, that we, we suffer from a recreation, a, a, a recreation um, perception. You know, we, we help kids do claymation and stop motion animation. So when you see someone uh, sculpting in clay, it looks like, oh, that's playtime. But yeah. what, what, what is not seen about them working with that clay is they have written a script, they've written a really solid story, they are recording audio, they're editing that audio, they're recording, they're making a video using the animation process, they're editing that video. If, if, they, if they are our age, they know. You watch Godzilla and all of that, and, and, and a lot of that, uh, a lot of things were done with clay animation. Yeah, yeah. Stop, exactly what you're doing, well, stop with it, move the hand. And, and for many people, it seems like a classic outdated form of entertainment. And I'd say two things to that, first of all, we use it because it's, it's, it's magic for those kids when they experience it. It's so like, I did that. Gumby. I did put that together. And, and plus, you don't have to be a, a, a talented drawing True. artist yeah. to do an effective claymation character. In fact, a lot of our kids do Lego characters. So it gives them an opportunity to, to flex their creativity even if they don't have the drawing talent. Uh, but the other thing about uh, stop motion uh, so it's not only a great platform for learning multimedia skills, there's a lot of it. When you look at advertising, there's a lot of what is in current advertising that is based, it is based generated through stop, stop motion, motion animation. animation. So it may be, you may think of it in terms of Gumby or, you know, uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed no, Reindeer, right. but it is still very prevalent. And, you know, we also teach things like green screen. So what your audience may not know is there's a green screen behind us and the picture you're seeing is not what is standing behind us. We teach kids how to do that. That's what Spider-Man and all of these action, a lot of the action, they got the green screen and you're teaching them how to merge that into a production. Right. So, so those multimedia skills, you know, first of all, we want every kid to have a basic level of, of, of multimedia skills. Um, and then we also would love to introduce them to a multimedia career, which can be really rewarding, both from a creative perspective and, f and a financial perspective. One thing I will say about uh, making sure that every kid has, has some of those multimedia skills, whether they go into the career or not, is our schools are significantly missing the opportunity to give them the skills they need. And part of the reason is that the standards that are driving the tests that they're taking have a, an innate bias toward print-based communication, books, literature. I mean, I love literature. I was a major in that area. But when they get into multimedia skills, it's more about ways to move or convey those print-based communications and less about using it. I mean, they talk about- But they're fighting for their lives, the print and the radio You're media. Right. And, and uh, this is what I, I learned uh, and didn't realize uh, myself as it relates to how this media is distributed to the public and the types. Uh, I was doing some stuff with Parks and Rec and you'd be trying to introduce some new things. And it's more so, they have, like at City Hall, they have one uh, media section that's handling all of the agencies and they're all doing it the same way mm -hmm. because it's coming out of centralized mm -hmm. location and it's hard to make any changes. Mm -hmm. And when you start talking about uh, doing something that's not print and they have all their eggs in print, mm -hmm. it's very hard yes. to, to get what you're trying to yeah. do, some traction. Well, and that's, a, and that's part of the problem I think that education is facing. Is that a lot, not a lot of people who go into education have extensive experience in media. Um, and maybe some, some elements of multimedia, but it may be an area that scares them a little bit. And what's happening for us is we have made the switch as of May of last year. Our focus has always been offering uh, after-school programs and uh, summer programs. Uh, what kind for, of funding do you have to have to be doing that? Well, <laughs> that, the reason we stopped doing it is it wasn't working. We, you know, we were in the Linwood Area Ministry Place. We had a studio there. We were loving the experience we were having with kids. Um, but two things happened. First of all, the kids we went to serve weren't a significant part of our audience. We, we are located there for the same reason that I'm interested in the Lathogram Project. 
we want to serve the kids in that e those east side neighborhoods who may not be getting the chance to understand what a digital media, digital media career can do for them. And so what was happening is, you know, we, we put out our information about our workshops and we could get the soccer moms and their kids from every suburb around Kansas City, but those kids in, the, in Urban our own backyard could, were not showing up. Well, it's, it, it's about economics, mm -hmm. uh, and I think off camera I talked to you and I showed you a bunch mm -hmm. of videos and, and everything is about the economics. And then we talked about uh, the sustainability mm -hmm. of a business like mine, and I yes. was say, saying to you uh, that there's a whole lot of uh, there, there's a whole lot of obstacles that we have to deal with, and so when you come into the urban core, because uh, if there's no money there, if people are trying to uh, see how they're going to put milk on the table, mm -hmm. if kids are trying to see uh, they don't have no internet at home mm -hmm. per se, yeah. and what have you. It's very hard for you, as you said, the soccer moms. They, they, they are. Yeah, kids. yeah. We'd, we'd have we'd have some drive from Leavenworth, Lawrence, to come to our workshop because they knew how important it was for yes. their kids to get that skill set to That's compete exactly right. with the type of talent that is coming off the conveyor line worldwide, mm -hmm. not just here in Kansas That's City. Right. Yeah, and and you stated that. Uh, Poland and some other uh, with that yeah, Asia, yes, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. with uh, this animation, especially Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, how we won't compete? Yeah, it's gonna be tough to compete but at those salaries that they're paying those people. Uh, so, um, what what was, it was a real disappointment to me that we had to shut our doors because shut, you know we had to shut things down because you know, we we although we served. A lot of those kids, it wasn't, we weren't getting them there. And, you know, I learned a whole lot in the process about, I was naive like probably most people are coming into a neighborhood that hasn't been their, their community. Right. And, you know, I wasn't trying to be a goody-goody, you know. A do-gooder. Yeah, do-gooder. <laughs> I have a genuine interest in, in it. I mean, let me tell you my story, why I'm doing this. And I'll bet you have a similar story about how you ended up doing right. this. I, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I came from a poor background and I, you know, when I really got kids, other kids to be interested in me and, and kind of figuring, hey, I had something to offer, was when I wrote a story in the seventh grade that my teacher read to the class. And they loved it. It was kind of like, hey, I think this would be fun to do. In, you know, let me, what else can I do with this? That's, what we're, that's the experience we're trying to get for our kids in these workshops. We want them, you know, for some kids it's going to be the audio recording, for some it's going to be the story development, for some it's the sculpting. We want them to find something in digital media that really resonates with their talent. The light bulb comes on. Yeah. Bam! And that's going to lead to a career um, path for them that takes them where they want to go and, and do what they want to do in life. Uh, not every kid that goes to our workshop is going to take that path. What's the most kids that you've had at, in your workshop? Uh, well, the biggest one was uh, for, is, is it Nesby? I forget the... Nesby, uh, uh, you were over there with Willie uh, with Wells. Wells. Wim Wells. Wim and, Wells, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I had 60 kids in one workshop. Now, keep in mind that the typical uh, team that we s put together for uh, stop motion is three. So I'm thinking, how do I have a meaningful experience for 60 kids? kids. I, you know, without going into detail, I made it work and it actually led to a new format that we offered time and time again that really proved successful. But it, it really, your best results are working with small teams. Um, for one thing, if you have 10 kids on a team and they're writing a story, it might take 10 months to get that story finalized because everybody has an idea. One of the biggest skills, well, last year we worked with kids in the gifted program at um, Scarborough Elementary in, Olay in Olathe. And one of the biggest values that they got was not even really a digital media skill, it was the collaboration skills they, they honed because- Learn how to be part of a team. Yes, and they had the story, they had the storyboard from beginning to end, the whole story, and everybody had a different idea about where that story needed to go. go. And they had to learn how to give up their own personal stake at time and acknowledge somebody had a better idea. And it, um, 
it really, I think, helped them in some ways that moved beyond the digital media front. All right, and winding up, uh, could you tell our audience if they would like to support uh, what you're doing, uh, some of the things that they could do financially or uh, lobby-wise or whatever? Sure. Um, you know, obviously anytime anyone can do donate directly to our organization, that really helps us. And you can do that by contacting me or going onto our website, which is digistory.org. Uh, we have a donate donor page. But probably what helps us even more than that is to connect us with people who have a passion for what we're doing and are willing to have be a sustaining donor over time. You know, we have struggled to get grants. I you know, told you how right. effective I was at Hallmark on grant. Twelve million if I Yeah. I we have we have really not been able to land a lot of grants. And part of it I understand if you're um, if you're providing food on the table or giving people medical uh, coverage that they can't afford on their own, that's an important uh, street level service that, that people need compared to what people might But receive. that has nothing to do with this educational stuff. That, that they're supposed to be doing that off the bat. Yes. Those type those services. Are the first services you get but, out there. But again, you're talking about teaching someone how to fish versus exactly. go to McDonald's. You're exactly. And right. and that that is way more important if the sun comes up tomorrow. That's right. You're you're exactly right. I, I really you know, I like I said, I came from a poor background. I never dreamed where I grew up in Michigan, you either worked on in the car auto industry and if you got landed a job at an auto plant you had life by the That's right. Uh But uh, it was not an economically strong area where I c came from. When, you know, when I uh, had an experience at one point where I realized people can do what they like doing and make a lot of money doing it, it's like that cha totally changed the direction of my life. And that's what we want for kids that go through our workshops. Well, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Mm -hmm. And as we do in closing, when you invest in your community, you're really just investing in yourself.